I'll end here so that we have some time for question and answer session or contributions or comments. So Doc, maybe you can uh, facilitate that session now. Right. Thank you so much, Doc. Uh, that was wonderful. Now, incidentally, what, the last talk was supposed to be by uh, Christopher Lalusha, who happens to, I think he works for. Okay. He used to work for Absa. I think Absa and Majd or something. Uh -huh. <laughs> but it's, it's it's a good thing that uh, good thing that you gave this talk because he was probably going to give a talk that's tied to the banking sector. Okay. I think he was unable to because he's a busy person anyway. Uh, but. Uh, now I saw John somewhere. I wonder how much of what you're doing, and I know John. John is probably going to ask a question here. Uh, John was enrolled into CSC fifty seven forty one last year. Mm -hmm. He's, he's uh, wanting to explore code detection in the telecommunications sector. So I wonder how much of what you do is is going to eventually borrow. Uh, but before I I, I I invite questions, I also wanted to I guess just to point out to the CSC fifty seven forty one students here. Number one, an apology, right? Now, there are certain things that we will not cover in CSC 5741, sadly, right, because of timing constraints, uh, specific techniques. Right? Like when it comes to clustering, for instance, you, you probably notice that we only maybe look at one or two or something, sadly, because of timing constraints. Um, and then also, uh, I wanted to point out the fact that for the first time in the eight, is it eight talks that we've had so far, for the first time, someone has decided to use a different approach, I don't know if people notice this, a different approach other than the, the so-called crisp DM model that we've sort of like adopted as part of CSC 741. If you notice, he mentioned he used the KDD process. Mm -hmm. I hope people are taking note of that, important. Uh, and then also, uh, important thing that Knox mentioned, specifically metrics, right? When he was ranting about the root, the root mean square error, for instance, we, we're actually discussing those things, specific metrics when you are conducting experimentation in lecture series number seven, which I think I've uploaded. I do apologize that uh, we are, uh, we, he's giving this talk or people have already given talks before we actually get to discuss some of these things. But uh, if people have questions, uh, the floor is open, please. Just feel free and uh, ask your question, ask away if you can. Uh, if not, I'll be on the lookout in the chat to see if there are questions. I have one. Yes, please go ahead, Zola. Um, so, uh, Nox, in the beginning, right, you were talking about how mm -hmm. existing approaches were pretty much rule-based. So I'm just curious, then, for that, did you compare your model, like, the results you got from the model compared to, like, the rule-based approaches that were already used? Um, come again. I think I, I, you were breaking on that question. Uh, so I'm saying that like, in the beginning of like, in the first few slides, we were mentioning that pretty much what, uh, this biz what these businesses do for the most part right now is, is to use rule based mm. approaches. So I'm just curious as a for that you then at the end compare your model to these rule based approaches and see like which one is better, be it in terms of precision or recall or anything else. Um, yes. Um, the comparison was done. Remember, if if um, earlier when I mentioned about um, the the current approaches being uh, static or some form of uh, static rule based, where they have specific uh, features they have to focus on when um, when uh, looking at the transactions. Uh, in th in that itself, they are leaving out a larger part of transaction which they don't know about. What like what's happening? With, once they get what they are looking for, that's it. But what about the rest of uh, the transactions? What what else can they learn from that? This is one thing our model was able to do. So yes, we did that. I'm, I'm not sure if um, if I've answered your question. Um, so it's not so much about what, uh, what I'm asking is not really so much what the difference of um, kinds of frauds you can detect, right? But based mm -hmm. on the data set that you had, right? Because I think you had about 20% for the testing. Or mm -hmm. I'm not sure. I think it's 20. I'm not sure because you were saying 30 sometime, but it doesn't matter. But the 21, did you also like try to throw the 20% data set on the, the role based approach and see how good is it with that data? Okay, no, no, actually that, that was not done, but uh, it's actually a good uh, note from you, uh, which is something I may need to take down actually. Thanks for that. Sorry to 
But it's coming on Thursday, is it on Friday? I don't know when you're defending, they will ask that question, right? <laughs> because it turns yes, out they will. And you're lucky that he's asked that question because you probably want to have um, a very clever response to that question. If it's not in the dissertation, it needs to make sense. Yeah. They will ask you. Because if you claim to say what you're doing is uh, maybe is, is what should be done, I mean, compared to what, right? If something mm -hmm. already exists, how good is what you're proposing? You know? For sure. Uh, any more Definitely. questions? Hello, I can, I can ask. Ah, uh, yes, John. Yes, yes, yes John. Doc, how are you? Uh, no, how are you? Yes, John. Uh, good evening to the guys present. Uh, thank you, Nock, uh, for the insightful presentation. Uh, we all know that fraudsters and, uh, and fraud are in internal battle. Like, you know, every time detection technology improves, Mm -hmm. Fraudsters are developing their methods to avoid detection. Just like they always sit here trying to research here and there, they're finding a way of trying to penetrate our systems and yes. increase their profit. Uh, my question, uh, I just wanted you to maybe to explain further a bit on the process of uh, the PCA, the principal component analysis. Mm -hmm. And it's, uh, many, like the main benefit of it, has it really improved the accuracy by reducing overfitting of some sort? Then I was also looking at the, the, the paper that you published, uh, Research Gate. On, on the further works there, there's a, there's a part where it says you plan to incorporate text mining implementation in the model in order to discover some common words that are used when carrying out transactions. I don't know, maybe if you can just highlight, maybe uh, <laughs> explain a bit further on that one. Okay, okay, all right. Thanks, uh, thanks, for the, uh, thanks John, for those two questions. So. The first question you are trying to understand um, if indeed PCA will reduce um, overfitting of a model. Yeah? Yeah, like improve the accuracy. Um, yes. Um, remember, earlier when I mentioned that um, the data set involved with the transactions had uh, some form of high dimensions or multicollinearity among the variables. Therefore, PCA would definitely improve uh, the performance or overfitting of the model once once it's applied on the data set. Okay. And then um, the second question, text mining. Yes, and thanks for actually bringing this out. I should have mentioned it. Um, what I would want is um, once the patterns are given or the patterns are, are, are obtained, uh, like patterns of unknown transactions, it would be nice to actually now know what kind of uh, words are associated to those transactions which are being done. For example, um, on uh, maybe savings account, you notice that maybe you find patterns of uh, transactions happening on accounts which are dormant. It would actually be nice to try and understand what kind of references or narrations or any words associated with those trans in short the nature of the transactions which are happening this is something i would want in future to be incorporated unfortunately i couldn't manage uh well because of time and also just the technique i was trying to use didn't give me the desirable results and i know um someone here presented something about um uh, is it linguistics which involved obviously some bit of form of text mining which was actually interesting so yes, text mining is something I would want to incorporate in, in, in this. And if someone would want to chip in and they have maybe some form of easier way of achieving that, I would be more than happy actually to, to learn that. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Where exactly would you be mining this, this text though? From which sort of sources? Because I, I was actually going to, um, just came in here, but I was actually going to ask, uh, uh -huh. I don't know if you, you, are, you are privy to kind of respond to this question. I was going to ask the sources of those those records, right? Mm -hmm. We know banks have different sources, right? Yes. ATM machines. Yes. The transactions that are originating, from, I don't know if you track things that are originating from these supermarkets when I'm swiping. Uh, yes. So I was getting a better sense of where you'd be mining this text exactly. Um, obviously, the, the source would be, uh, I can say the database where these transactions are sitting. Now, I understand banks can have 
different data sources depending on the nature of transactions happening. For example, uh, for anything related to ATMs or, or internet banking, they will have a separate uh, database. And then for, for, for core transactions, like for example, over the counter transactions, or if someone walks into a branch, they will have a core database which will record uh, those. So um, to get those different sources come together, this is where now maybe you would bring in issues of uh, a data warehouse, can build a small or mini data warehouse and then be able to populate it with data from various sources and then be able to do the pre-processing from there. And um, just more on the same text mining, uh, this is this I believe can be helpful actually to understand fully the nature of the transactions. Um, you'll be interested to know that I've been a victim before. I won't mention a bank, but there's a certain commercial bank. It's a foreign bank actually, where I've I've been hammered like three times with uh, maybe a 200 kwacha, 50 kwacha, 60 kwacha, and then when you look at the statement, you can't actually understand what sort of a transaction passed. And then the worst nightmare is for you to actually walk to the branch, you go and ask uh, maybe the customer service advisor or customer relationship manager to explain, and then they can't actually give you a proper answer as well. So you are left wondering now, okay, so I didn't do these transactions and for me to maybe understand, is it a monthly charge? No, because I know what you charge me on a monthly basis to maintain an account with you. So if I didn't do this transaction, and I can't make sense of um, uh, the nature of the transaction because the narration or the reference is missing, the text is not there. So these are the things which are actually happening in DOC. I've, I've been a victim before. All right, any uh, other questions? I have a suggestion now as well, as part of the feature work thing. Yeah. Okay. Um, so, a couple I, I, of, I, I think that I actually remember you did the presentations around in uh, text mining. Yeah, something of that sort. Okay, okay. Um, so, what, a couple of, I think it was last year, so our like, the revenue service had an interesting issue. A person who works for the revenue service was bribed, and one of the things he did to sort of um, legitimize the money, he, he deposited like in lump sums in an ATM would suggest that a, a single transaction itself might be fraudulent, not by itself, but rather in like as a sequence. You see what I mean? Like it's fraudulent <laughs> because of like other related uh, um, uh, transactions. So perhaps you should consider this uh, this notion of sequence, the sequential nature of the transaction is, uh, in the future. Okay, that sounds interesting. Okay, That's, uh, thanks for that. Um, now um, I'm not sure if let me just take you back to this. Would um, would you care to comment on this um, here count? Because um, I, I had tried to include the sequence, or, or rather, oh, sorry, I, I, I get it. You mentioned the frequency sequence. How would I be able to use uh, maybe the count, like the, the number of times a particular account was involved in the transaction? Can can that help to enhance on, uh, more on it? Ha! <laughs> I'm not an expert in like in fraud because the thing is, even the term for me um, is it's a bit lottery because fundamentally, right, is one has to understand like what mm -hmm. the like, if, the what well, my suggestion is just about the nature of the sequence, right? But the problem okay. is that like I don't want to say yes because perhaps there might be something important. It might not be due to the sequential nature of it. So I, again, it comes down to it also like mm -hmm. what does fraud mean in the first place? Okay at least from a competition perspective. Like, how do you operationalize that? Okay, okay. But I suppose you could try to use counter, yes, but like, again, it all comes down to back to it, this notion of what does fraud mean. Okay, okay, all right, thanks. Any any other questions? I've, I've comments? seen, I've seen a, a, a very good comment from Andrew. Uh, he's suggesting that I should actually do a brief introduction on geo concept. This is actually very good. Thanks a lot, Andrew. Uh, like the general ledger kind of thing and how 
accounts uh, work with regards to respective GLs, yeah? Because obviously, someone who will be on the panel uh, won't be a banker, we presume, and maybe they will need to understand more about the GL concept. Thanks for that, Andrew. Okay, well, you are most welcome. That, that is true. I mean, you probably want to give a bit of context, but remember that I see someone who was defending a few days ago. You must remember that you have 10 minutes, right? So in those 10 minutes, you want to trade carefully. They will stop yes. you if you go beyond 10 minutes. So you, you want to strike a compromise between uh, focusing more on the important aspects of the dissertation and you know, okay. these are the things that make it so important. But it's always nice to provide a bit of context. You know? Okay. Uh, but, but the assumption is the examiners probably have like intimate knowledge in what you did, right? The thoroughly read through your dissertation, uh, but maybe it's going to be for the benefit of those that are just going to be in the public audience. Any, any other questions? Looking at the time here, we can stretch a bit further, seeing as this is the last uh, talk in the series. Uh, um, as we're waiting for questions, I hope you will have a response for why you settled for PCA, right? Specific oh, specifications. I mean, it is mostly about. Oh, okay. Hello. Uh, I'm here, Doc. You were saying something? Oh, I thought I heard someone say there's a question. I was going to say, uh, as we wait for people to ask questions, you want to make sure that you think about uh, justifying some of these decisions. Mm -hmm. Why PCA? Right? And I know this is a trivial question, but why PCA? We know you know the reason, but you want to justify why PCA and not these other, uh, yeah. I guess this okay. is part of the solution. <laughs> why Can you settle for these other linear transformation? Can I can I just uh, maybe comment on uh, why PCA? Yes, of okay. course. If you want. To. Yeah. Uh, now, of course, there are, there are many ways to achieve dimensionality reduction, uh, but most of these techniques usually will fall into one of two classes, namely feature elimination, which um, I think reduces the feature space by eliminating the fe uh, eliminating feature, and uh, the other one, feature extraction, which creates new independent variable where um, each new independent variable created is a combination of each old variable. Uh, I don't know if that's making sense. Now, one disadvantage of uh, feature elimination is that no information is gained from the variables that are dropped. Uh, this is something I, I, I came across when I was doing uh, referencing and research about PCA. Uh, this is why I was prompted to try and adopt uh, PCA. But again, like you said, I think it's it's always best to prepare yourself uh, with with a very nice answer when such questions pop up. Yeah, you want to because uh, incidentally, LDA yeah. does not eliminate the features, right? So and it falls within the same class. But the simple the simple reason, I mean, looking mm. at the data you're working with is. Uh, uh, so these, these these techniques fall into two class, clusters, right? So ones that uh, look at uh, linear dimensionality reduction and some of the, the mm -hmm. other class is the one which falls under the non-linear mm -hmm. dimensionality reduction uh, technique. Mm -hmm. So I mean, I mean the, the simple the simple the simple answer to that question, or one of the solutions to one of the responses to that question would be that you are looking at data which has some sort of temporal attribute, time. Right, moving average, mm -hmm. whatever it is you are calling it. Okay. Any any questions? Any other questions? Comments? Suggestions? And I guess we are. It's a dry run for Knox because he's doing his viva voz, uh, so he was killing two birds with one stone, I suppose. I don't know. I actually appreciate a lot, Doc, for this opportunity, and I think it couldn't have come at a better time because. Um, yeah, so the interesting questions I've gotten and uh, comments and suggestions will actually prompt me to to prepare adequately for either Thursday or Friday. I'm yet to get confirmation which day I'll defend, but this was a very good chance for me to to do a presentation, and I thank you so much. If, if there are no questions, I mean, I, in closing, I have a, a few uh, probably things to think about here. Um, <laughs> how how did you arrive at the nine clusters? You know what what metrics did you use? 
Uh, and um, it's a rhetorical question because I want the CSE 5741 students to benefit from the answer. So that's one question to think about. And then when you were, there was a part in the presentation where you were describing the clusters. Did mm -hmm. you involve, did you engage any experts? Or did you do this alone? And if you did this alone, I mean, what justification do you have for doing this analysis alone? You know, trying to identify, trying to identify to explain clusters is not an easy feat, especially if you're not an expert in the domain, right? Uh, so those two questions. Yes. Number of clusters, how do you arrive at the nine? And then uh, uh, when describing the characteristics associated with those clusters, did you engage any experts to try and help you explain those things? Okay. Um, okay. Thank you for those two important questions, Doc. Number one, um, how did I arrive at nine clusters? Well, um, I used, um, there, there is what we, for, for choosing the number of optimal or optimal number of clusters or K for clusters, uh, there were two options which I looked at. One, uh, the elbow curve, um, and then two, comparing that against the, the what they call CERTO score analysis. I hope that's the correct pronunciation. Um, let me see if I can just uh, show something here. Are you still able to see my screen? Yes, we can. Okay. Um, and again, uh, actually, this is something I should have mentioned, but then I was trying to, to beat time. Um, so when you look at this, the, you can either use the elbow curve, uh, which where, whereby you determine the optimal number of clusters for the chemists against uh, the CO2 analysis so that you fully, uh, you're fully satisfied with which value to settle for. Now, this, the, the score values signify how far uh, uh, the observations can be from a cluster center. And it's very prudent that these scores fall around the region of zero or very minimal. A large positive or large negative would indicate that the cluster center is far away from the observations. So when you look at this, for example, number of clusters is showing um, uh, these numbers and then you pick where the curve is happening and mostly that's where you center for. Now, uh, this is showing nine, but um, I broke my notepads in two pieces. So you- not no, Sorry, not to cut you short. I was going to say the elbow, the elbow looks like it's at four there, right? Yes. <laughs> anyway, yeah. was, uh, no, actually, the, this one I'm showing <laughs> is a different one from the final one I used. I don't know if I can say it like that because I, I broke my, I broke my, uh -huh my notebooks into uh, bits and chunks, you know, when I was doing these experimentations. And then um, just to explain on the CO2 score analysis, uh, which obviously gave me a better optimal number of clusters. Um, when you come down here, I found this to be excellent because not only was it showing the scores, but uh, I was able to also get a graph. Maybe perhaps I should uh, see if I have that here. Let me see. Yeah, something. This is what I was looking for, actually. So you see, um, a CERTO score analysis, uh, it, it will give coefficient or ex it will exhibit a peak characteristic compared to a gentle bend when you're using the elbow method, which is easier to visualize, actually, in my, in my understanding. But others would be comfortable maybe with the elbow uh, curve method. So when I did this, it gave, um, for number of, by the way, for, for clusters, for any clustering, the minimum can only be two. It can't be one, then there, there's no clustering. So it usually starts from two. So when you look at this, the two will give that score, then the three will give that score, the four will give that score, five will give that score and so on and so forth. And then um, actually the nine is what gave me the high score with regards to the CO2 score analysis. And this is how come I was able to settle for this nine. And when I did the plot, you know, the graph, it actually gave something like that. So to answer your first question, Doc, this is how I was able to pick the optimal number of clusters. <clears throat> Excuse me. But again, this would depend uh, on the 
size should I say of, of the data you have you find that maybe the beta score will be at six or the beta score will be at five so again it depends on the data shape or the size but in my case uh, it gave me actually uh, an, uh, nine as n clusters to to use and then the second question you asked was um, with regards to involving an expert to interpret the the patterns of the patterns picked in the clusters was was that the question, Doc? Yeah, because I mean, if if you look at uh, I mean, for most problems, that's, mm -hmm. it's it's usually a subjective to a certain extent, yes. right? And uh, like if I if if you have no idea, no inclination of what the data is about or yes. what sort of patterns you expect to get out of the data, you probably need someone who has intimate knowledge of how things work. Yes, for them to be able uh, to come up with. I guess, oh, yeah, so mm -hmm. quite simple well, question, were, were experts engaged or not? Yes, experts were engaged. Um, in the banking sector, you'll find that someone is, um, is an expert in two things to do with uh, savings accounts. Then the other one, uh, usually maybe a credit uh, or loan officer will be an expert in something to do with loans. So they understand how repayments, how loan uh, reductions should be done. So when the patterns were obtained, yes, the key uh, experts were actually consulted just to try and understand uh, the patterns which we, we picked out. And more especially also on the, the transactions found on the dormant accounts. This is why I was very confident to mention that most of the people, uh, or when I checked, I was actually advised that nowhere unless otherwise if an account is dormant there should be no transactions taking place on that account and if a loan is fully paid off no further recoveries or entry should be happening on that loan account so i i involved some experts okay that was a, that was a rhetorical question by the way meant to in the event that you didn't have the response they will ask that question i'm sure they will ask that question anyway. I okay. didn't mention it in the presentation. Are, are there any other questions before we shut uh, this down? Uh, comments, suggestions for Knox as he prepares for Thursday, D-Day or Friday or something? Uh, mm -hmm. Aspects that you thought were interesting, looking at what he was working towards, no? A, a, a very simple question for me, seeing as people don't want to ask questions, right? Yes, how much of what, what you were saying, especially when you're describing the problem, how much of it is, is specific to, I mean, now NatSev is a, I guess you might classify NatSev as being an indigenous bank. It's also yes. relatively small in comparison to these other large banks. Would mm -hmm. you say that perhaps uh, these other banks like Standby, Standard Bank probably have sophisticated mechanisms in place and maybe they've already addressed some of these problems, or are they in the same boat as Natsev? Uh, just um, curious here. I know you probably talk with people in, in these other banks, right? You also yes. worked at UBA, so yeah. yeah. Definitely. Um, you, well, you'll be interested to know that, Doc, that uh, um, most banks don't have good mechanisms, actually, to completely uh, eliminate what we can say uh, fraud there's always something happening for as long as data is growing and for as long as patterns are not known. Uh, they, uh, remember earlier when I mentioned that um, the checks usually or all the checks from what I've gathered on the ground are prompted by what they call random checks or targeted audits. Maybe something happened and then uh, that's when they'll be prompted to start the investigation. And again, the other example I gave, which actually happened to me, this is a commercial bank, a very big commercial bank actually on the market, uh, a foreign one. Uh, up to now, they haven't been able to explain to me the unknown entries or transactions which happened on my account. Okay. And uh, the other one which I mentioned was um, another commercial bank, which where actually people were even fired. Uh, we heard stories that a lot of transactions were being done even on dormant accounts from customer accounts. And this was actually in public domain. So to say most of these banks are 
quite confident when it comes to tackling uh, issues to do with fraud, I would say no. There, there is always something happening. Okay, just to add on uh, that's good. Doc, uh, uh, just to add on what Doc has said. Yes. When it comes to fraud, it's a very sophisticated uh, act. You know, like I was saying, in as much as we might be sitting trying to research and prevent it, they are also trying to find a way of penetrating our systems. It might come from outside people. It might be as well as uh, the inside, if they leave the organization of some sort, or if they are still there. So it's kind of uh, tricky to really, really completely shut it down. Mm -hmm. Right, right. All right, uh, but tied to this fraud thing, I mean, I, I thought uh, the, the graph that you that you highlighted, that you showed showing the trends, I thought that was very disturbing, right? Especially if you link it to um, dormant accounts. It, it, it sounds like such a very trivial thing, right? That it doesn't require any sophisticated analysis. Uh, you know, like I, I find it hard to believe that a whole lot of nuts uh, would not be able to, uh, to identify like suspicious activities on a dormant account. I mean, it sounds like something that should be a part of like some reporting that is done on a month on month basis or something. Uh, also tied to that, I was curious as to whether maybe that could be a, a glitch in the system or something, right? Um, is it possible? Or, I, I don't well, to, to answer your question, I think you've just prompted me to just uh, maybe mention the, the bank I kept referring to. <laughs> um, this is actually Zanaco Bank, Doc. I'm sure you heard it some, some time last year in the news. And um, I have one or two friends, and we got confirmation actually that, yes, they found that some transactions were actually being done on dormant accounts. So uh, you see, the, the tricky part is... Um, these accounts will attract usually minimal uh, amounts of figures, maybe 10 kwacha, uh, 20 kwacha, you know, maybe 50 kwacha, such that people won't actually pay attention, even if they get statements to check, even if it's uh, maybe reconciliation officers they're trying to go through. So you'll find that someone like John alluded to, it could be somebody in the inside or they're working with someone on the outside they will identify that a certain dormant account has got some good balance sitting on it. Maybe for argument's sake, it has got 3,000 kwacha or 5,000 kwacha. That will attract someone, obviously. And they notice that the account is dormant. Now, when the account is dormant, it, uh, chances are that uh, monitoring on those or checking what's happening, it's, 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 I don't know, for whatever reasons, attention is not paid uh, to to that for obvious reasons because they expect that the customer if they have to use an account again they will come back to have it reactivated but there they are they they've, they've ignored that and then you find that someone will work with a chap from outside and then they would start moving these minimal uh, blocks of figures so if you multiply for example uh, maybe 20 quarters times maybe 40 times uh, that's a good money someone will get going unnoticed so this is not actually my bank uh, even big banks such as zanaco which was actually in the spotlight sometime last year these things happened and we had complaints it was all over uh, on the news and in the public domain and uh, and and look, I, don't know, I, don't know, uh, I, I, I don't know if you had a chance to also read um the FIC report, a very controversial report, the Financial Intelligence uh, Trends report, especially for 2018, uh, where uh, no. I'll, I'll see if I can retrieve that and share with you, where actually uh, they cited quite a good number of uh, dormant accounts involved in these huge transactions, actually. So it's, 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 it's happening. It's happening. Yeah, I'm wondering how much of, of that is maybe like an inside job or something, in which case, like if if a Knox of this world, I'm sorry to say this, but mm -hmm. if you're involved <laughs> and you're part of, I guess, the, the tech team that has intimate knowledge in these things, I'm, I'm sure you, you'd 
be sure that those dormant accounts are not discovered or something. But uh, it would be nice if you could share the, the report or maybe I will look it up and then I'll share it together with your slides and the video recording so that whoever is interested might, uh, mm -hmm. might read up on some of these interesting things you just mentioned. Uh, okay, no problem. Oh, you know that. at the time, yeah, thank you. Looking at the time, as we shut this down, just wanted to say, I'm wondering if we can apply some of these interesting things that people are working on and John is going to be working on fraud at UNSA, right? Fraud detection at UNSA, grades, it's there. Maybe at third year, well, at fourth year, one of the capstone projects, we can do it as a small little project. It would be nice. I, I don't think they're using any sophisticated mechanism to try and cluster student grades and results, right? To try and uh, see if there are any any suspicious or any clusters that you might you might you might come across or something that would be nice uh so in closing i just wanted to ask if maybe uh you would be in a position to share the data set that you used so that we can incorporate it into next year's cohort if i'm going to be involved in the in the course if you don't have a response to that i'll reach out to you uh in the sidelines but it would be nice if you could share the data set uh, this is what I've been doing with most of the previous speakers, like Francis is willing to share the uh, the entomology data set, right? Okay. Unfortunately, NS cannot share the data set because it's, it hasn't yet been digitized. But I don't know if you can share that. That would be nice. We don't know how large um, the data set is. You didn't tell us how um, large it is, how many transactions between 2017 and 2019. Okay. We'll, okay. This is something we can talk offline doc and uh, i'll see what i can yeah, of course do. you but, can anonymize it you don't need yeah to, yes because it's uh, it's highly sensitive and i would need to check what to drop and what to either code and shield but uh, we'll talk thank you I, I know people are getting tired of the data set that i normally use they don't like scary research output like a publication numbers and whatnot but okay <laughs> thank you so much Knox. Uh, very best wishes on Thursday. We don't know if it's Friday. We know you uh, you probably do just fine. You probably want to rehearse so that you don't go beyond the 10 minutes. Uh, also, thank you thank very you. much to the participants. Uh, okay. Thank you so uh, much. We're really okay. grateful that you could join us. Uh, we will confirm. Yeah. Oh, I was going to say we will confirm if uh, the mini projects are going to be public. If you're interested in finding out what uh, the current cohort of CSC 5741 students were working towards some really interesting things, by the way. They are scraping things from Facebook, so on Zambian, Zambian Facebook pages, scraping comments there. Uh, there are some people working, uh, working on data sets associated with some job portals that are specific to Zambia, so some really interesting things. It would be nice if you could just attend and uh, who knows, maybe we can spark some interesting conversations that we can take beyond CSE 5741. Thank you so much uh, and uh, best wishes. Uh, stay safe, everyone. I'll ask the CSE 5741 students to stick around. Thank you very much. Okay, thanks. Thanks, Doc. Thanks.